Hello and welcome to Amanda's Trying, where sometimes all we can do is try and get through a day, and that's okay. I am Amanda, and today I wanted to talk about the things that they don't tell you about concussions. I'm trying really hard, I promise, but all that I could do today was cuddle my dog and cry. So before we get really into the video, obviously we've rearranged my room, so the backdrop is different. Sorry if you missed my books. So yes, today we are going to talk about things that the average person probably doesn't know about a concussion, things that I wasn't really aware of until after I got one and was dealing with symptoms for a really long time. And it was really frustrating for me to figure these things out on my own or find them out when I felt was like way past when I should have. <laughs> like it should have been one of the first things that you learn about. Obviously this isn't like going to address every single thing that people don't know about concussions. But these are like the main ones that like really frustrated me and surprised me about concussions. All right, so the first thing that we're gonna talk about is the importance of sleep. So I think a lot of people still have maybe an outdated education when it comes to concussions. Sorry if you hear my dog shifting. Years ago, when somebody got a concussion, they would be told to go in a dark room and don't get any sort of stimulus like you're rusting everything, but then also like the initial time after the concussion, you're not supposed to sleep because there was this myth that like, if you fall asleep and become unconscious, you're never gonna wake up. There was like kind of that um, myth, I guess. But the research now shows that sleep is so incredibly important, especially like right after you get concussed because the research has found now that the brain is able to heal when you're asleep. That's when a lot of the work that the brain does in the healing process, that's when it happens. So if you keep interrupting sleep, like waking somebody up every hour, um, it doesn't allow the brain to get into the REM cycle, which is really important for recuperation and just healing in general. So that has been a change in the research in the recent years, but I don't think a lot of people are necessarily aware of that. And for me, when I got my concussion, even though they said, you know, like you can sleep and you can do anything as long as you don't get a headache, like that was kind of the, the instructions I was given. The importance of sleep was not stressed to me, and I really had no idea that that could be really impactful on the rest of my recovery. So when I got my concussion that same week is when I picked up my puppy, who's moving around right now. So I had a two-month-old puppy <laughs> right at the beginning of my concussion. And as you can imagine, with crate training and potty training, um, you don't get a lot of sleep for the first couple of months. And it was my dog. <laughs> and I had, you know, said that I was going to take care of him. And we didn't know how debilitating my concussion was. There wasn't that understanding yet. And so I was waking up. <laughs> every few hours for the first few months to take my puppy out to pee. So the reason I'm still here is because of this fool. No. If you get a concussion, prioritize your sleep and make sure that people around you understand that sleep is really important and you need to be getting However much sleep, like especially at the beginning, if you feel tired, if you feel like you need to sleep, go and do that. That's kind of 
the right thing to do, especially at the beginning. Obviously, if it is turning into a really long-term thing, there is probably then going to be an adjustment of how much sleep you should be getting. But initially, if you're sleeping, I was sleeping 12 hours a night, and then I would be sleeping for at least a couple of hours during the day for the first mm, mm, three months. And like, they were telling me like, all right, that's what you need. So go and do it. So another thing that I really wish people talked about more and people were just aware of um, is the fact that recovery isn't linear for concussions. It's not this nice and easy straight line that goes up consistently. It go, you know, you'll go and have a couple of good days and then the next week you just like have brutal days where you're not able to do anything except for like be alive. And, you know, that's what happened this past month for me. Like, all of September has just been me in survival mode, basically. And, you know, August, especially at the beginning of August, like, I was doing really well and I was excited and also scared because, you know, you get your hopes up and you know that a setback might happen. And every time it's just so devastating because... <sighs> You got used to not having this much pain and this mu these many limitations and all of a sudden they're back again. And it can just be so hard to like process and accept and it's hard for people to understand as well. Like I was explained this is your reality with a concussion by my physiotherapist and by my chiropractor and a lot of people, like, I was explaining this, but I feel like the average person doesn't know that this is a reality of concussions. And so they'll see you like one day and you're having a good day and you can visit for an hour and you can smile and laugh and engage. And the next time that they see you, if you're just like, totally out of it and struggling or if you aren't able to go to something like people I, I feel like they don't understand like you know well I saw her two weeks ago and she's doing fine so like why isn't she here now I feel like when concussions are talked about in general the it's super simplified it's like okay like concussions yeah recovery is around a couple of days to a couple of weeks and like that's it <laughs> and they don't talk about the fact that a lot of concussions have complications, a lot of recoveries are not straightforward, there's so many treatment options, and, and that can be so overwhelming as well. It's so hard that there's no standard for treatment and there's no standard for recovery with concussions. I found this really nice, succinct website that talks about different treatment options. Keep in mind it is American, so it's not necessarily completely accurate to the Canadian healthcare system, if you're Canadian or whatever, but um, it gives you the rundown on treatments that are research-based. I think because recovery isn't linear, when you have setbacks, you start to feel desperate, like maybe I'm never gonna get better. Maybe I just need to try this thing as crazy as it sounds. And so here's a website that kind of gives you some like really baseline information on stuff that has been researched and proven to be effective in treating concussions. So check that out if you would like. Another thing that I personally have never heard talked about and none of my um, healthcare providers, that's the word, none of my healthcare providers or anybody that I've gone to for concussions, like, it's never been talked about. The fact that, like, for women, concussions are kind of on a completely different scale. I noticed it in my personal life. Um, when I talk to friends 
even just thinking about people who I know who have had concussions, almost all of them are women. And if they are male, a lot of them were in like highly competitive sports environments. Whereas like women, it was like they got hit in the head with a dodgeball in gym class or they fell and got whiplash and got a concussion. And with the friends that I know that have had debilitating long-term post-concussion syndrome like me, all of them, actually that's not true, but almost all of them are women. And I kept on noticing this in my own life, but I didn't know if this was just like a coincidence that, you know, I was just noticing, but it, it doesn't extrapolate to like the general population. But naturally, I was curious as a woman and as somebody who is still struggling with concussion symptoms. So I did research and I did more research when I was working on this video. And what I found was that females do have higher risk for concussions. And I think that should just be talked about way more because it's not really talked about at all. There's a higher risk then for when women are playing high level sports and are doing some of those things. Um, I don't think that girls are really aware that like there is a, there is this this difference in concussion rates. Um, they found that even just in general traumatic brain injuries are worse in females than in males. When it comes to baseline symptoms of concussions and um, neurological tests, women's results are, are different than men's. And they usually have been affected more severely than men. So then another thing is, I've mentioned this before in some of my um, videos, and this was something that I was told, but only after I had a concussion. Periods affect your concussion. Um, so when I was on my period, not only did I have to deal with everything that comes with a period, but my concussion symptoms got worse as well. And it's just something that people with periods have to deal with just super fun. <sighs> and when I was researching this video, I actually found a really interesting article that found that depending on when you got injured, depending on like where you were at in your cycle, that affected whether or not you even got a concussion and how severe it was. So the article found that if you were injured during the last two weeks of your cycle, there's a higher risk of more severe symptoms, which I think is like really mind blowing. Um, and there has been some research that found that there's a possibility that one of the reasons women do deal with more severe concussions than men is because of the neck. and. That was actually mentioned in my video with my brother um, because we're a hockey family <laughs> and Sidney Crosby, who I assume everyone knows. Sidney Crosby has had, you know, a long history of concussions and the research that he did on his own and the treatment that he did for himself was very much based on the neck and strengthening that and men just have a tendency to have wider necks and so they then don't have as severe concussions um so i will i've linked that the article that i found but if you want to go to my video with my brother there's also like a i don't know if it's like 15 minutes a video where sydney crosby talks about his experience and his treatment with concussions if you want to learn more about that. But to top off all of this with gender, the little, the little cherry on top, we can't have a conversation about gender without 
you know, a little sprinkle of sexism. Because the fact of the matter is, I've been talking for seven minutes about Jeffrey. Yep, that sounds about right. Okay. He was, he wasn't a victim, if you know what I'm talking about. Thank you. No, that was just part, I'm just getting into the first act. The fact of the matter is, most of the research done, really about medical treatment in general, but especially about concussions, has been done on the male body. The male body is seen as the standard and the female body is assumed to be the same as men. So a lot of the research and the treatment options that are invested in and really seen like how they affect and help people, that's all been done mainly on men. And it's just assumed that the same treatment that works for men will work for women. But as these articles, <laughs> this research specifically looking at women and concussions show, concussions for men and women aren't the same. And so I think a lot of the reason this is my own theory, but a lot of the reason why a lot of women have post-concussion syndrome and deal with longer concussion symptoms is because there's been a complete lack of research on what is actually helpful for women and how concussions affect women and what we need to do to get recovery. Super frustrating, but on... A positive note, let's try and end it on a positive note. During this research, I found a really amazing website. It's called Her Concussion, and it looks specifically at the way that concussions impact women, and also, you know, really centers on looking at research that is focused on women and concussions. So if you are female and struggling with concussions, or Maybe this is just something that you realize this is really stupid that this, you know, lack of information and understanding of the female body, like that's really dumb and you just want to learn more. Her Concussion, really, really cool website that I found. Because the brain is so complex and we can't really, you can't really test and see exactly what the issue is, even if, you know, they are specialized in concussions or are used to treating people with concussions, they can't really give you answers. And that's a really difficult thing to accept. And it also wasn't something that I was ready for. I was thinking, okay, I'm going to these different professionals and somebody's going to be able to help me and tell me this is what we're going to do to get you better. And the reality is they would, you know, start off sounding very confident and would start this treatment and say that this should help. It helps, you know, most people. And then I'm doing it for months and maybe it's helped a little, but I'm still debilitated at the end of the day. So my advice to anybody who has a long-lasting concussion, I would say as soon as it seems like this is going to be like a long-term thing, you know, if it's been a month and you're still debilitated, I would already be like, hey, get me in with a specialist. Get me into an ABI clinic, a TBI clinic. Um, that's Acquired Brain Injury and Traumatic brain injury clinic. So the last thing that people don't talk about is literally the worst lesson <laughs> I've had to learn th through this entire thing, and that's how to advocate for yourself in the healthcare system. The amount of stress and anger that trying to just get treatment has given me, the healthcare system is not <laughs> an easy system to navigate, even for a healthy person. You know, things like the fact that there is this thing called post-concussion syndrome. I wasn't told this 
until eight months into my concussion. You are considered to have post-concussion syndrome after three months, and nobody told me. And I was not in a position to be doing research, okay? I couldn't look at a screen longer than 10 minutes. I couldn't write an email unless I took breaks and worked on it for an hour. So I'm not gonna go and research brain injuries because <laughs> I didn't even know that I had one. <laughs> or, you know, like other aspects of the concussion. There are aspects to a concussion that severely affect your mental well-being. People would only treat the physical aspects of my concussion. And I am telling you, the mental aspects are way more difficult to deal with. Because pain is pain, whatever. But when you don't even know who you are, you don't even believe that you're injured, you feel like you're a burden on your entire family, you feel guilty for being alive, that's a lot more complicated to try and figure out how to get through that moment when you're feeling those things than, oh, I have a headache. I had to go and I had to advocate for myself and I ended up getting into a therapist and getting counseling, but I could have used that months and months before I actually asked for it. But this is the reality. You have to be your biggest advocate when you are sick or injured in the healthcare system and it sucks and it's so hard but you're not going to get treatment if you don't do it so tips for advocacy because it's so exhausting and overwhelming but here are some ways some concrete ways that you can work on it in your own life First of all, you need to have an in-depth understanding of your own health issue. You need to know more about your body and more about your disorder than your doctor does. Because if not, you're, you're going to miss things. They are going to miss things. Miss issues that you need to be treated for or possible treatments that they aren't aware of or won't refer you to until you specifically ask for them. You have to be the expert. And so if you're not able to do research, I would really encourage you to find somebody in your life, whether it's a family member or a close friend, who can help you with that and who can do research and who can advocate by your side. Um, don't settle for less. When I, honestly, for the first six months of my concussion, I was completely complacent and it wasn't my fault. I was in so much pain. I had a migraine almost every day. I was dizzy. I could not concentrate. I struggled to follow conversations. I was not going to be in the doctor's office asking questions and demanding more from them. But because I didn't do that, I didn't get quality care. And my mom, I really just like didn't have the energy to even have her advocate for me. And I really was like, just please leave it alone. I'm just going to sleep it off, which obviously didn't work. But no matter how tired you are, you're still worthy and you still need to have quality care. And so if you're not able to advocate for yourself, having somebody like my mom, who you trust and who you know is going to look after your best interests and also listen to you and, you know, maybe they just need to project your voice, but have that person because if you, if you don't ask for more, you're going to fall between the cracks and you're going to be left behind by the system. Another piece of advice, find your own style of advocacy. So this was something, honestly, I'm still working on it. My mom has her style of advocacy. And for me, um, that is not my personality. 
Um, although advocacy is about demanding what you need, um, it might look different for you. It might be quieter. It might be gentler. But you need to figure out how you are going to be active in your own healthcare. Because if you are passive, people are going to write you off and they're going to do the bare minimum. And that's not going to be enough for you. So find a style that works for you and own it. And the last piece of advice is be persistent. You're going to feel annoying. You're going to <laughs> feel like the doctors hate you every time you call them, but you have to keep in touch and you have to follow up. Follow up with clinics if you're on a wait list. Follow up with your doctor if you have a test done and you're waiting for your results and haven't heard. Um, keep in touch with everybody who has been working on getting you better because the healthcare system is overloaded and professionals are struggling to handle it all and stuff gets missed, people get overlooked, and you don't want to be that person. Or if you are that person, you want to make yourself known and you want to make sure that you get the care that you need. Okay, so to end off this video, I feel like I just ranted. I don't know if this is even going to be a good video, to be honest. I just wanted to focus on a couple of really cool concussion resources that I have found. The first one is Keep Your Head Up. It is a foundation and a charity founded by two women who have experienced concussions themselves and post-concussion syndrome. And it just has a lot of resources on helping with the mental aspect of concussions that I have talked about um, in this video. And it's just a really encouraging one if you're going through this and you feel alone. There is also the International Concussion Society. It's based in the States. Um, but it has a lot of interesting information and statistics. Um, and again, I think it's just really helpful sometimes to like recognize that you're not alone and that there's people who see what you're going through and are doing what they can to educate people and to fund research. And, you know, people are wanting to help and people are trying to help. There's a whole movement. And so that can be really um, encouraging and help with feeling hopeful. So check out the International Concussion Society. And then I already mentioned this one, but Her Concussion, it's a really cool website and it's a really important, um, aspect to concussions that needs to be talked about more. And so check that out regardless of who you are, what your experience is, because I think we all need to, we all need to know more about that. Song recommendation. So this video, my song recommendation is Forever Rain by RM. And this song is honestly just like a piece of art. <laughs> RM, um, he's an amazing lyricist and he's somebody whose lyrics honestly are more like poetry than anything else. They're just so beautiful. This song, I think, really just validates like feeling sad and letting yourself feel sad, which has been my past month. <laughs> and I know a lot of other people, it feels like long seasons where really you just feel sad and that's okay. And the idea of like rain the rain keeping you company and like crying with you. I don't know. It's just um, such a comforting song. And so, check it out. Pigao, <laughs> 
나도 너처럼 어딘가 두드릴 수만 있다면 온 세상에 진하게 입 맞출 수 있다면 그 누군가 나를 맞아줄까 내 고된 몸을 어쩜 받아줄까 so loud. for just 20 minutes. Health professionals don't even fully understand it. It sucks. It sucks so much. This is just gonna be a video of me ranting. But anyways. <laughs> I just completely lost 